Antonius says that for a professional broadcaster, Hannity sucks at speaking. So have you have you looked at Roger Ailes's book on communication? The, the way that he would test whether or not someone would be a good professional broadcaster is he'd watch them with the sound off, bro. So to get the full Sean Hannity effect, you need to watch with the sound off. It is, so pay attention in Pennsylvania. Herschel Walker continues to outpoll radical Raphael Warnock in Georgia. That race also remains close. And perhaps the biggest political news uh, comes out of the deep, deep blue state of New York, where Republican Lee Zeldin has now officially taken the lead in a brand new poll by Trafalgar. That's Robert Cahaley's group. Now, Lee Zeldin will be here uh, as he's campaigning with Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. That's straight ahead. And now the numbers are really, both of them will join us, uh, now the numbers are really encouraging. But let me be clear and let me pause right here. These races are very, very close. Most of them are within two points. So make no mistake, it doesn't matter if your preferred candidate is in the lead, if your preferred candidate is behind, if your preferred candidate is in a dead heat tie. Anything can happen. Don't think for a second this is a slam dunk. In other words, every voter needs to do their part. Take nothing for granted and don't forget what is at stake. Okay, so you are the message. This is actually a pretty good book by the late Roger Ailes, the man who developed Fox News. So he says, look in a mirror and study your own face. Begin to talk about a political issue and see which part of your face moves and which doesn't. Using the same subject matter, Repeat the conversation. However, imagine that you're now speaking to a child. See if your face softens, if your eyes become more expressive, if there is a tendency to care more that the listener understands what you are saying. Most people tend to use more facial expressions when talking to children. So I need to start talking to you like your little children. Let the little children come unto me. Okay, here are the 10 most common problems in communication. All right, this, this is a good book here by Roger Ailes. All right? Lack of initial rapport with listeners. Stiffness or woodness in the use of the body. Presentation of material that is intellectually oriented. Right? And the speaker forgets to evolve the audience emotionally. Speaker seems uncomfortable because of fear of failure. Poor use of eye contact and facial expression. Lack of humor. Speech direction and intent unclear due to improper preparation. Inability to use silence for impact. A lack of energy causing inappropriate pitch pattern, speech rate, and volume, and use of boring language and lack of interesting material. So you're asking, Forty, what does it mean you are the message? Forty, Richard Spencer's on with Ethan Ralph right now. Forty is a much better speaker than Roger Hannity. Roger Hales effed up when he passed on Forty. Talk dirty to me, Forty. Yeah, oh, Glenn Bentley says, I read that book. Some of it was good. Yeah, some of it is good. So I want to see Richard Hanania in a prime time spot at uh, Fox Bro. Good evening and welcome to 40 tonight. <laughs> okay, you're the message. What does that mean? It means that when you communicate, it's not just the words you choose to send to the other person that make up the message. You're also sending signals about what kind of person you are by your eyes, your facial expression, your body movement, your vocal pitch your tone, your volume, your intensity, your commitment to your message, your sense of humor, and many other factors. The receiving person is bombarded with symbols and signals from you. Yeah, we're always transmitting. And if you're an addict, you're transmitting the disease. If you're God intoxicated, you're transmitting God. We're always transmitting, like a 50,000-watt KFI radio station. So everything you do in relation to other people causes them to make judgments about what you stand for and what your message is. You are the message comes down to the fact that unless you identify yourself as a walking, talking message, understand you're constantly transmitting, you miss that critical point. The words themselves are meaningless unless the rest of you is in synchronization. So if you're uncomfortable with who you are, it will make others uncomfortable too. So I was talking to a fellow sex addict the other day, and I was saying that the most important part of recovery is becoming comfortable with yourself. So... If you did shameful, shameful things in the past, you need to be able to talk to someone about them and to relay honestly what you did without getting all tensed up, without your voice you know, croaking in shame, without you getting a shame attack, your face blushing red. You need to be able to talk about everything you've done so that you are at ease with yourself. Right? That's the best way 
to minimize the chances of having your life disrupted by addiction. So generally speaking, people with secure attachment patterns, meaning people who move towards people who treat them well and who are good for them, and people who naturally move away from people who treat them badly, and people who have a positive image of themselves, right? Secure attachment. These people are the least likely to be stuck with addictions. On the other hand, people like me and the way I was raised with insecure attachment patterns where I just obsess over relationships that are important to me or avoidant attachment patterns where you feel like you know, just any kind of attachment is just way too scary. You just prefer to be on your own. Well, that creates a vast hole that addictions kind of rush to fill in. So over the past few years, I've learned to become increasingly comfortable with myself by you know, attending the appropriate 12 step meetings. Uh, five to 10, 15 minutes of daily meditation has helped. Uh, getting in a routine. I'm someone who needs routine. Chaos is not good for me. So I have a disciplined routine. And that that helps me achieve a comfort level. Having money in the bank, regular money coming in greatly helps comfort level. Having good relations with my family, friends, wider community, neighbors, acquaintances, right? Getting along with people, having the best possible relations with everybody that I interact with. That does a tremendous amount towards my feeling of comfort. Uh, developing my health, working out, getting you know decent sleep, getting plenty of exercise, you know, eating right, stuff like that. And then noticing what makes me agitated and journaling about it and, and working it through. So the more comfortable I am, the less likely I am to fall prey to you know ridiculous addiction. So I used to try to soothe my anxiety by pursuing sex, by pursuing pornography, by attention seeking by you know going to extremes in politics and religion but if i can just calm down then i tend to make better decisions luke recommends alexander technique for the face oh, no alexander technique is a holistic technique right? the alexander technique is a way for noticing how you react to a stimulus and whether your reaction serves you so many people react to a stimulus by their head you know jutting forward tipping back compressing the neck now, one shoulder tends to be, you know, higher than the other. One hip is going to be rotated forward, you know, wrenching the whole back. Uh, people carry all sorts of unnecessary tension around the eyes, around the lips, and, and around the forehead. Like, look at this beautiful forehead. Do you see my forehead crinkling right now? Do you see all sorts of unnecessary tension around my eyes? Do you see the you know, waves of tension just radiating from my lips? I'm a man who is at ease in the world. I'm at ease with me. I'm at ease with you. I'm at ease with this beautiful community that we're creating. And so that radiates from, from my face. Facial Alexander techniques, disgusting but effective. Well, here's, here's a basic Alexander. Let go of everything that you think you know. So notice I took that in. I let go of everything that I think I know. I have moved from a state of judgment when I do live streams, I'm frequently in a state of judgment. And now I'm just in a state of awareness, I'm just observing what's going on around me and I don't need to judge it. When I do that, my, my face relaxes, the, the neck and the back unlock, the breathing comes easier. Like I get more width and more length as I let go of that unnecessary tension. And so the Alexander technique, it's a way of noticing how you react to a stimuli and then learning how to let go of those responses that don't serve you. We tend to build up body armoring, particularly as we get older, right? Body armoring are these unnecessary tension patterns. So if you can learn to notice what your unnecessary tension patterns are then start to release them, you will feel more at ease in the world. Other people will have more comfort with you because you are more comfortable with yourself. You will be less compulsive, you know, less driven. You will make uh, better decisions. You will be calm. All right, so... It's dangerous for an addicted personality to be struggling, right? If you have a tendency towards addiction, you want to minimize how much struggle you do. And when you do struggle, you want it to be in like an appropriate venue, such as you're, you're struggling to lift a weight or you're, you're struggling with, with a workout or you're struggling to learn Latin, right? You don't want to be going through the day struggling because you will be much more likely to relapse. It's like, oh, you know, I've done good. I just deserve to feel good right now. You know, let me check out some pornography. So 
Roger Ailes says he would travel to various cities to evaluate TV talk show hosts who spend time with them. But before meeting the first time, he'd check into a hotel, watch their programs on TV and with the sound turned off for five to ten minutes. So if there was nothing happening on the screen in the way the host looked or moved that made me interested enough to stand up and turn the sound up, then I knew the host was not a great TV performer. So Roger Ailes would watch the screen for interesting expressions on people's faces, sudden movement, laughter, or whatever it made me say, hey, I wonder what's going on here. I want to reach over and turn the sound up. So the less uh, unnecessary layering of muscular tension you have, the more alive you'll be to the movement. And so one of the possible downsides to the Alexander technique is you become much more transparent. So when I do this show, I, I read your comments. You can, you can read literally the comments on the left side of the screen, but you can also read the effect of the comments on my face because there's very little unnecessary muscular tension on my face. When I read your comments, I, I react, and you can see my reactions to your comments just flowing across my face. So if you have access to videotape, ask someone to interview, then turn the sound down. Watch yourself. You're still interesting. Place a mirror by the TV telephone. Watch yourself as you speak and as you listen. Do your eyes and face look engaged and lively? So when you let go of that unnecessary muscular tension, which can be in your forehead, around your eyes, around your lips, right? When you let go of that muscular tension, you're going to look much more engaged and lively. Right? Do you gesture when you speak? Do you ever smile? So people who are the best communicators communicate with their whole being. They are animated, expressive, interesting to watch. So tape an ape. Buy a tape of a famous actor. Reading selections from literary works. Record yourself reading those same selections. Compare your vocal quality. So tape an ape. Tape the best professionals. Try to imitate the pros. Try to develop a range for your voice. So you start down here, range or vocal variety should be your goal too. What makes a voice interesting, alive and distinctive, just as you'd watch, right? So you have that uh, vocal variety, but mainly you want that uh, climbing the staircase, right? You want ascending melodies, just as you'd watch a tape of Jack Nicholas swinging a golf club to help you perfect your own swing. From Martina Navratilova swinging a tennis racket to improve your backhand, you can do the same with recordings by professionals. So you get that ascending melody there. If you care, they care. So if you care about what you're talking about, other people will care. If you care, your listeners will care. Your voice will automatically move up and down. You'll automatically start ascending the staircase. Right? If you don't care, your voice will flatten out and be boring. In every communication situation, ask yourself, what am I feeling here? How do I feel about what's going on? So right now I'm enjoying myself. Being committed is crucial. Very few people freeze up or are able to speak or go into a monotone when they feel strongly about something. Roger says, when I speak to others, I'm always in control of time. That's rate of speech, pauses, space, where and how I move, eye contact, emotional messages that my eyes send, my voice volume, pronunciation, changes in pitch and tone, my state of mind, calm, happy, upbeat, self-confident, my attitude, I'm threatened open-minded, friendly, the flow of dialogue so that I know when and how to insert my ideas and opinions and my feelings. So he says, I can correct 15 communication technique problems with one ounce of energy. It's fundamental to success. With the right energy, you are absorbing what others are broadcasting to you. You project enthusiasm. Most so-called speech problems clear up automatically if you are energetic and enthused. So a good communicator's energy is a life force. It's a vitality. Properly focused energy comes across as positive, a magnetic intensity rather than a negative overwrought intensity. So it's an inner flame that we all display where we sincerely believe something we talk about. We're committed intuitively. We know true energy when we see it and hear it in a communicator. It's the energy associated with a Harry Truman, Truman or a Martin Luther King or a Winston Churchill. We all know people who radiate this life force in abundance. When people with energy speak or even listen, they don't display inattention or lack of focus in the eyes or lack of interest in the face. People in love have energy. People who love their jobs have energy. If your energy is up, your rate, volume, and pitch will be appropriate to the situation. If you're enthusiastic, if your posture is good, if you're friendly, if you're comfortable, then you have the right kind of energy. 
So Roger says when he first started speech coaching, he did it the old fashioned way with drills and practice on rate, pitch and volume. My clients made progress, but it was slow and tedious. Today, I do it organically. I work on the energy level of the communicator. So that was the one of the challenges for Dennis Prager when he got into radio. The, the people who are in charge of the station, the program directors would keep telling him, more energy, more energy, more energy, more energy. So that, that's one of the, the big differences between the professional broadcaster and the amateur is that the professional broadcaster has those ascending melodies, speaks with a tremendous amount of energy. So compared to how you'd speak in, in normal life, you need to speak with at least five times, if not 10 times the amount of energy on a YouTube live stream or on the radio or on TV. So what's the energy level? Is it appropriate to the situation? What are your goals? What are you trying to say? What do you mean? How do you feel? How much do you care? If you're in touch with these things, your technique will improve quickly and dramatically. Most people think that their energy level is much higher than it is. Now he says 80% of our clients are surprised when they first see themselves on tape. They say, I didn't know I was so boring. That most people come across with insufficient energy. Most, 99% of us are kind of inhibited. And so we don't really go far enough with our energy. Look forward, I'd love to play poker with you. Don't play poker. <laughs> yeah, my face is way too transparent. You'd, you'd take me to the cleaner. Relaxed and at ease with the world. Harmony of mind, body, and spirit. Roger Ailes always knew the right moment to pinch a bottom. Because I've never known of a person being fired because he refused to talk to the press. So when in doubt, don't talk to the media. Remember, the media has nothing to lose by interviewing you. On the other hand, you could have plenty to lose. Okay, let's uh, get back to Greg Gutfeld. It's just exploited. But even without an election, they'd probably do the same damn thing. They cherry pick the psycho's political positions to pretend he's conservative, you know, like Liz Cheney used to do. <laughs> what, did he compare her to him? Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> I hope you think that, you idiot. Meanwhile, Republicans focus on crime. Home invasions are up, as are murders, rapes, and robberies. And in places where politicians advocated defunding the cops. We can call that a political take, too, except this one is rooted in reality. I suppose Republicans could have made up stuff as well, like there was a wooden gavel found at the scene with chocolate haagen ice cream on the handle. <laughs> but they didn't. And so the media screeches like Kamala having her feet tickled. <laughs> How dare you bring up violent crime, even after a violent crime is committed? Right. If you righties continue this fact-based <laughs> we're going to smack all of you with hammers. So you're only supposed to talk up violent crime for fake violent crimes. So there are lessons here, but politicians and the media, they aren't interested. It's about only political outcomes. Last week, it was pretending John Fetterman's brain worked. <laughs> now, now it's the Pelosi attack was MAGA, January 6th. And hate speech, it's a constant threat because it's code for criticizing Democrats. But as long as they win in November, then nothing ever needs fixing. And that's why the criminally deranged are still on the street. That's why this happened. There's nowhere for the mentally ill to go. And bottom line, if Pelosi had just been another victim, who knows if they'd even give a damn at all about this? If it was just an Asian lady, we'd likely be told beating people with a hammer is a misdemeanor. And the media help. Yeah, good, good point there. Okay, so here's a, another book on a similar theme. It's the autobiography of the founder of 60 Minutes Australia. Say it with feeling, Gerald Stone. Megastars, media czars, trailblazing TV memoirs of a prime time warrior. So after the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, Gerald Stone got a little concerned about living in the United States. He thought it was too dangerous, so he moved his family to Australia. Now, his father was a Russian-Jewish-American bootlegger. Then uh, Gerald Stone and family moved to Australia in 1962, and he noticed that Australians tend to be much more emotionally repressed than Americans. So Americans tend to much more wear their emotions on their sleeves. So I heard one... American Sound Dennis Prager's radio show that she went to the Sydney Opera House and after her performance, she was the only one to stand up and cheer. So this exuberant display of emotion, much more of an American thing than an Australian or an English thing. So journalists in any country tend to treat the news the same way. But as a newcomer, I brought a precious asset, a fresh pair of eyes, along with the sharpened perceptions of a stranger eager to make his mark. 
My writing style stood out as different from what Australian readers were used to. I made an extra effort to explain things that my colleagues regarded as too common to bother with. And as many Australians were still burdened by the reticence of their British heritage and unused to discussing their feelings, that reluctance to delve too deeply was reflected in the press coverage. As a recently arrived American, I was constantly made fun of for being part of a population obsessed with psychoanalysis, but my background made me more prone to pursue issues most of my Aussie colleagues treated as taboo. So he noted Australians treated their beaches with the reverence of open air, reverence cathedrals. When mates got together, they did so on the basis of absolute equality in Australia. Americans tend to be earnest and idealistic. Australians tend to be more reserved and skeptical. So Australians are less burdened by sentimentality. They have less of an over-eagerness to please. They're more skeptical, more quick on the draw with a deflating remark. In uh, 1964, John Lennon said to Gerald Stone, how'd you get into this country? I thought they had a white Australia policy. And uh, in the 1960s, he interviewed a theater manager who said, if someone's got abo blood, he's got only one place, and that's with the other darkies. They all smell, they're ignorant, they drink too much. People from the un- outside just don't understand what they're like. So Gerald Stone became entranced by TV and its far greater emotional impact compared to print. Something as simple as a momentary pause or a tightening of the lips could alert the public. So he met David Frost. He noted he was as charming and charismatic in person as he came across on screen, but not for a moment longer than he needed to be. The veins in his temple were as easy to read as a stopwatch, flashing purple to let you know precisely to the second when your time with him was over. And it was back to business for him, moving on to devote himself to another one of perhaps a dozen other projects. So he was the quintessential TV personality skilled performer trained to communicate with his viewers at every level not just through the words he chose but the varying rhythm and pitch of his intonation more than with voice alone he spoke with his eyes the tilt of his head his every expression and gesture journalists might be highly trained in the art of gathering information but they weren't half as effective communicators as david frost the facts don't sell themselves take someone willing and able to use every trick in the trade to get their message across to say it with feeling. So Gerald Stone hired his TV reporters at 60 Minutes Australia, wanted them to be as warm and animated in their delivery as they might be at a lively dinner party with close friends. Whatever the story, tell it in a way that makes each viewer think you are speaking directly to them with such feeling that they can't help but listen and care. So TV stardom is the ability to come across as the kind of natural, friendly person anyone could easily relate to. So Stone says, Australians tend to take life less seriously than Americans, much less prone to hold strong views on personal choice issues such as sexuality, morality, religion. All right, let's get a little bit more here from Greg Gutfeld. Helps by amplifying the fake origin to avoid the real one, which is the mental health crisis, which goes ignored like Joy Behar's sex strike. <laughs> their, their state, California state logo should be a bear in a straitjacket. And with all the homeless in campus, their new state motto should be the Golden Shower State. <laughs> their state bird, a $1.7 million toilet. I know it's not a bird, but they don't have a, st- they don't have a state appliance. So the suspect was a homeless psychotic, like tens of thousands on the streets. And they're a danger to you, but now also to p- politicians' spouses. The things that happen to everyone else finally happen to someone who matters, the husband of the speaker. He's not a cop, a retiree, or a student. He's rich and powerful. And if they throw the book at the suspect,